ahead and get started and um, yeah, kick it off. So welcome to the premiere of the Kate Courtney and Colleen Quigley Book Club. <laughs> we did it. We're, We're all doing here. it. Oh no, like you popped in the waiting room. That's weird. Um, <laughs> there's more people entering. Welcome, welcome, welcome. The more the merrier. This is very okay. exciting for, for us. Um, we have been thinking about doing this book club for quite some time now. And yeah, it's just great that uh, Alexi is able to join us for our first one because she's a sister in sport and just an amazing human being and a friend of ours, which is just a great way to get it started, I think, to kick it off. Um, so Alexi, I just want to introduce you to our all of our friends that we have on here in case anyone um, doesn't know all about the amazing human being that you are. Um, so Alexi's a good friend of mine um, and also in the same sport as me, but she runs a different event and she actually competes for a different country. So she competes for, for Greece um, and she's uh, mostly in the 10K. She was in the 10K in 2016 um, in Rio, finished 17th in 31, 36 in a Greek national record. No big deal. Um, I think Alexi would probably say that was, you know, just an amazing experience for her and one of her best races ever. And to have one of your best races ever at the Olympic Games is pretty dang special. Um, but now Alexi's training mostly for the marathon. She's gone up in distance since 2016, which is cool. She's also beyond her athletic endeavors, um, an actress, filmmaker, director. So she's got that creative component to her as well. Um, her most two most favorite movies or our most um, popular well-known movies are um, Track Town and Olympic Dreams. Um, so two athletic kind of themed movies. Um, and she wrote and directed them and starred in them, uh, wrote and directed them with her husband, Jeremy. So they're uh, definitely a power couple and, and work together professionally, which is really cool too. And I would actually love to hear about what that's like um, at some point too. But yeah, yeah just uh -huh. generally, Alexi is an amazing human being and just has all these different, I think we're just so excited to talk to you, Alexi, because you have all this different stuff going on and you really embody like that phrase of more than an athlete. You are more than a runner. You are more than just even a filmmaker and actress. You know, you just have um, so much going on and are inspirational to so many people, um, you know, men and women, boys and girls, like whoever you are, I think you can relate to a lot of the things that Alexi talks about in her book, which is still more people are joining. Um, her book is Bravey. If you guys haven't read Bravey yet, um, Kate and I are both avid fans. Um, I've listened to the audio version of it, which Alexi reads. Um, the Ford is by Maya Rudolph and she reads The Ford, which is really cool. Um, and then just, I read it too, because you, you have to like, you know, underline everything and bookmark tabs and <laughs> all that. So if you haven't read Bravey yet, um, it's everywhere. It's, you can just Google it. It's everywhere. Um, and this is her new book. So this is what we are going to talk about today. Oh my gosh. And there's still more people. Bravey two days ago. So this is like perfect timing. Um, Fresh. Like, I don't know you personally, but I am a huge fan. I am a little outside the, the running world. I'm a cyclist, but I really admire what you guys do, especially because I don't think I can make it under an eight minute mile these days. So uh, <laughs> it is really great to connect with you guys. One of the things I'm most excited about is just having three women in sport at the top of their sport, at the top of their game. Um, who I believe still have a lot to learn from each other. And I learned so much from your book. And, you know, I think I have questions now as an athlete about my career now and where I am, but also, you know, there's some questions that I'm asking, like for the little girl in me and for, you know, mm. that I would have asked you at the beginning of my career. And I think um, whenever we get, you know, female athletes together, I think there's a lot of kind of great cross pollination and, and learning yeah. that been uh at at every stage yeah absolutely. I, yeah I'm so pumped to be here with you both I mean you know like I know we'll all see each other in person someday but this is oh, truly someday. an honor 
Um, and so I'm, I'm super happy to be here with you and this huge group of people um, who I hope hang <laughs> They're out. They're growing us. too. <laughs> I'm going to keep trying adding new people as we go because they keep, they keep popping up. But um, Do they have to have are- your permission? Yeah, I I thought that I said no, like they, they just pop on, but that might not be a thing for Zoom because of um, like safety or something. So I have to like keep like admitting them in, which is super annoying, but I'm going to try and, and do it without you guys noticing. Um, okay, let's just jump right in. Um, the first thing we want to talk to you about is, I mean, mental health in general is kind of seems, it's a little bit fatty right now. Like everyone's talking about mental health, which is like the coolest fad I think I could probably think of that, you know, people all of a sudden, everyone wants to talk about mental health. Like everybody wants to discuss it. Everyone wants to know what people's thoughts are on it. Everyone wants to know what you're doing for your mental health. And I feel like at this point, anyone who's like not talking about it or acts like it's not part of their game or acts like it's not important or it doesn't bother them is like, it's uncool now. Um, Where's which it used to be like the opposite, right? If you talked about your mental health, you were weak and you had problems and it's like embarrassing. Um, and now it's, you know, it's like the exact opposite, which is cool. Um, but I want to talk to you about this concept that um, I don't know if everyone calls it this or if this is a known thing, but I'm calling it the Olympic dilemma, which mm-hmm. is like, it's this great thing that you're going towards. But the dilemma is that when you get there, sometimes it's not everything that maybe you hoped it was going to be, or it didn't fulfill everything that you thought it would in your mm-hmm. life or like for your happiness. Or you talk about like, um, what is it? You talk about mattering, like you want to matter. And if you get to the games and do that thing that you thought was going to make you matter. And then all of a sudden you realize that like, no matter what you achieve, no matter what success you get, like, it doesn't fill that void of wanting to matter. And I think that's just something a lot of people, but specifically since all of us are like in sport and, and um, striving for this like Olympic dream, something that we all can kind of um, relate to or like kind of understand. Um, and I think it's interesting because Kate hasn't, you know, gotten to that point yet. She's still like driving towards that. She hasn't um, gotten to the point where you're like at the Olympics. And then afterwards you're like, what? now (laughs) what do I do now um so I guess the question is like what that was like for you to like get there and then feel like oh my gosh I like just drove off a cliff um and like what did you do then um what are you doing now um okay so it's it's funny because the Olympics is really and I guess any big dream that anybody is looking to it kind of feels like um And I've, you know, I've said this before, but I just can't think of a better comparison than like someone you've looked up to your entire life that you'll (laughs) never, like, you don't think you'll ever maybe meet, but maybe you will. Like for me, I think that was Britney Spears when I was younger, (laughs) the Spice Girls. Like that was my era of fandom. And then you maybe get to meet them one day and you hope that they will meet the expectations you have for them and that they'll be everything you thought they would be and more. And sometimes, you know, when you meet, I guess like a celebrity of any kind, sometimes they are that um, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes you're like, oh, okay. That's like, (laughs) sometimes it's a little disappointing. And I think that's kind of how the Olympics can be for people. And I've seen it happen in many ways. Like my own coach, didn't have like the best Olympic experience. He had some injuries Mm. there and he still is, you know, an Olympian forever, but it wasn't like what he thought. And it's actually really interesting how it manifested for him because a lot of Olympians get this tattoo and most people it's well known that you don't get the tattoo until you're done. Like until you like Mm. are the Olympian. Um, I guess you could get it before, but I think most people get it after (laughs) and he got, he got this like kind of abstracted one. And I think that was like a reflection of, you know, what the experience was really like for him. For me, it felt like everything I wanted and more, it was like beyond. And that I think was partly because I, 
I tried to see every bit of chaos as like part of the circus of it. Like I tried to make it that thing, tried to see it in that way. But to your point about the moment after, that's like the most well-known secret in the Olympic community that nobody thinks about the moment after, because if we did, we wouldn't get there in the first place, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, you know, for those of us who put a lot of weight on the Olympics, which I don't know anyone who wouldn't, um, it can be quite a realization to find that all these internal, you know, problems or hopes that you had are never going to be solved by like an external solution. And um, I guess we have to learn it the hard way, or I certainly did. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't have to learn it the hard way, but you can (laughs) learn it the hard way. Um, So when it was over, I was just like, okay, what's the next thing? Because I I need to have this goal. I need to know what it is yesterday. And that wasn't very smart because there's like an adrenal fatigue associated with chasing any big dream. And I think like in pregnancy, it's called like, wait, how many trimesters? I don't know anything about that, but like there's a new trimester (laughs) that's like, okay, there's three trimesters, right? Trimester, gosh, Alexi. (laughs) So, um, <laughs> three during, but then, yeah, then you have like after the baby, like what about what happens that's, after and you can, yeah, there's, um, that's a new what, one, right? Yeah. That's a new trimester. So now they're quarters <laughs> and, yeah. um, maybe we need that for like any big dream where there's a moment of respect for that period afterwards after. and we're allowed to just like pause. And mm-hmm. I'm even thinking about that for the book. Like my book mm-hmm. was like a kind of Olympics for me. Ooh, so I'm trying yeah. to respect that now you know just like your movies too like after the movie came out and it was yeah. like pre- premiered and like now it's over and then you're like well like I was working so hard towards that and it's and it's going great it went great it was a yeah. huge success but like what do I do now um yeah well and yeah because I always do that and the truth is that for us athletes like we are going through some of the hardest things right after the Olympics, because that's when sponsor negotiations often happen. Like if you're really, if we're really getting yeah. honest, it's a very difficult time to be pausing when you actually have to be like actively negotiating your future. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what was the experience like for you, Colleen, with Rio and afterwards, you know, like what did it? Yeah. Well, I think, so this kind of, it's funny that you asked me that because it kind of goes to what Kate and I have been talking about a little bit about um, kind of like goals. Um, and, and Kate's going to jump in here with another mental question. So I'm not, not to like jump too far ahead, but my, my thing is that I didn't um, dream of going to the Olympics, like from a young age, like I didn't have the like years and years, like 10 years that I was like dreaming about this thing. And then I like went and did it and it was over. And then I was like, Oh, I, I didn't really get that because the dream of the Olympics only started for me in like, like the end of 2014, maybe. And then the Olympics were in 2016. So I didn't have that much time to like build it up. Like I still mm. really effing wanted to go to the Olympics. Like, don't get me wrong. I would have been devastated if I didn't get to go or I probably would have been pretty devastated if I felt like I like embarrassed myself at the Olympics or something. But, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say that I had the performance of my lifetime the way that you did, but I did okay. Like I didn't embarrass myself, um, made the final and I was the second US runner to, to finish behind Emma Coburn, who I was never going to beat you know, <laughs> at that time. So, um, I don't know. I, I just didn't, I don't think I got that because I had so few expectations about what it was going to be like and about what I was going to feel like and about how it was going to go. Um, yeah. But I also had a different experience because like my team didn't stay in the Olympic village, which looking back was like kind of unfortunate. Um, <laughs> cause I missed that whole part of the experience. And like when I watched Olympic dreams, I was so, I was so freaking into that movie because I was like, it gave me like a behind the scenes into what the Olympic village was like. And even though I had been to the Olympics, I hadn't experienced that, which was really kind of, it's kind of weird and like sad, but we, um, we were staying at a hotel that was close to the, where the United States was using a practice track at like some like air force base. 
Um, and so we stayed at a hotel that was like a five minute drive from there. Whereas the Olympic village was like an hour drive from there. And so my coach didn't want us driving back and forth on the bus, like two hours a day, um, in the car just to get to practice. Cause we were at, at the games for like, um, a week before we competed. So he didn't want us to do that. So we stayed at a hotel and we actually didn't come into Rio until a week before. So we missed the opening ceremonies. Didn't get to do that. I didn't know, <laughs> so, didn't know all this. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think we talked about a few months ago, I was on a run with the Barman Babes and sometimes in long runs, we get in these really, uh, we, we ask questions and we get in these discussions and Shelby threw out the question, what is one thing that you, if you could go back in your life that you would legitimately change? You know, it's like, there's so many things happen in your life that you wouldn't change because it's like, it, it was bad, but it be like, it formed who I am today. And so I would never change that, even though it was shitty, you know? And I said, you know, the one thing that I wish I, I, I would change is that I would have gone to the opening ceremonies. I would have stayed in the village because I never, you never know if you're going to make the team again. Like, you know, something could happen. I could get injured or just, you know, like have a stomach flu or something and never make the team again. And then I would have never experienced that. So that is definitely one regret. And I think uh, something that I will do differently the next time around, but I do feel really lucky in that I didn't feel like I went off the cliff afterwards. Like I kind of had such low expectations of like, what it was going to be like that I just kind of took it all in stride and like oh okay this is what we're doing like this is how it is and then then it was over and I was like okay I was like okay what do I like what do I do next like I just didn't have yeah I just didn't really have it that time but I'm more conscious of it than ever for this time around because now I've been working towards it for the last now five years and it means a lot more to me and I have bigger expectations for myself this time so now I have like a mental coach and I you know, I do a lot of work on my mental health, um, really consciously. So I hope that even though there's more pressure and more expectations and more lead up to it, I hope that I can avoid that like, um, Olympic dilemma again, this time around. Well, just that, you know, that it exists means that you're more equipped to handle it. I think. True. Right? I didn't. Yeah. I had never heard of it before. Kate, did you, is that something that you like are aware of? Yeah. I'm, I was super curious to hear a little bit about, um, you know, I've listened, it's like been a Lexi Pappas time right now. You're on a lot of the podcasts I listen to. I just heard your book. <laughs> One of the things that I love that you talk about is really incorporating mental health and mental maintenance and prehab and all of these kind of preventative pieces into your training. Like if it was just a piece of training. Um, and I think for me, that's seeing my sports psychologist and, you know, trying to be aware of it, but I wonder if you could go back, like, is there anything you would have done or if you would give yourself advice going into the Olympics that would have helped you be more equipped to deal with that? Um, because I know, as you say, like we can't think about after because we have to be focused on getting to that moment and getting to that goal. Um, but I do wonder, are there things that you would incorporate into your training? Are there ways that you would approach it differently that wouldn't take away from the goal, but that would equip yeah. you to deal with that moment? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I love is that you're not saying that the goal itself is the problem. And I think that that has been like a turn of, of thought that like we could, I think some of the, the discussion around mental health is like blaming the institution or blaming the goal itself. And I truly don't think that having big dreams or big goals is the problem. I think it's just our preparation for it. And I think that's an important thing to say because otherwise people might, if we say like post-Olympic depression, post like people might be like the Olympics is an evil thing and we yeah. should, you know, and it's not that's a great that point. we should be prepared from childhood to have a different vocabulary about mental health so that, yeah. So, uh, you know, for me, I just think, like it's so it's honestly so wild to me now because I can't unknow the things I know now but I like can't believe how much I didn't know then and I think we sometimes we feel that way about things in life where we're like what like and hopefully we look back and we're like how adorable that you thought x y or z and you lived to tell this tale and you had the lessons um 
I just simply wish that I knew um, that everything was going to turn out okay, as we all want to know, but also just that there was, um, that there is a, I, I, cause I think depression is begins as like a lack of recovery and, um, like an adrenal thing. I think it's a nervous system thing at first, if you're, if you are facing a depression, like I did, which was like a situational one. And that's where you're, you're fine. You're fine. And then you suddenly feel like you fell off a cliff. Like mine wasn't the kind of depression that is consistent. It was sort of sudden. Um, and so I just wish that I'd known that there was adrenal fatigue and that that's just like body recovery and that it could come back. And, and I also just simply wish that I knew that my brain, whatever was a body part, you know, and it could get injured. I and, love and, that quote. Well, because we're so equipped as athletes to deal with our bodies. Like we're so good. I yeah. mean, maybe we're not good, but we know better than to do the same kind of workout or training. If our hip feels weird um, yeah. or we haven't slept. Like we know everyone better. talks about that. It's like normalized. It's part of the normal discussion. Like we have all these things that we can yeah. do to get the hypervolt and we're doing the hip thing. And we got the exercises. Yeah. Like we're like, you know, especially runners. I don't know if this is true for, for cyclists, Kate, but runners are like neurotic, like type A, you know, want to, they want to ace the test. So like you give them a rehab exercise and a lot of runners will like, you know, they'll do do it every day. <laughs> like we're very, yeah. we want to help ourselves, but yes, the cool. mental part is not part ever part of that conversation usually. And maybe it's because the mental part is sort of invisible. Like it's like something yes. that you would have to admit, but you know, I've even learned since some actual, and I've shared these things because I'm like, this is life-changing, but some more tangible signs, because I think we all want, um, you know, the the actual excuse to give our be kind to ourselves we don't want to like make that decision for ourselves all the time and two two things that have helped me is like one yeah if I get like a crappy night of sleep I need to pause and adjust what Mm. I do but also figure out why I'm not sleeping like is that an anxiety that I need to address but two this like this face thing I, I don't even know if I've told you this Colleen but I've said it before on a podcast and I just have to share it again here because it's like so useful. Yeah, um, tell, 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 tell. <laughs> I want to so, know. <laughs> okay, I had this physio Cooney who actually, Colleen. I know met. Cooney. Yeah. Yes. So Cooney's he was like physio when I moved to LA, which was like in 2018, 2019, 2018, and yeah, no, 2019, whatever. So he, um, okay, I called him one day and I was like, my hip, like it felt like my hip was like broken and Mm. you know, like it was so strange. It was like, just very sudden. I was like, Cooney, I don't know what's going on. I think my hip's broken. He was like, I don't think your hip's broken, but I'll come over. (laughs) And he came over and he was like, he's so rational Cooney. I don't know. He's so calm. And he was like, okay, this is just like a nervous system overload, like in your body, Mm. which your body, you know, your body will shut down body parts to preserve like your brain and your heart and the more important body parts. And so he calmed down my nerves using his like techniques or whatever. And then he was like, Alexi, like, did you have noticed anything on your face earlier this week? And I was like, well, my, I don't know why you're asking about my face. Cause I'm talking about my hip. And he was like, well, listen, you have the most nerves in your face, your hands and your stomach. And that's why when you're nervous, your stomach gets all weird. Yeah. Um, But when you're overloaded, the first signs often come up on your face. And I was like, you know what? Um, Earlier this week, I had like this very unusual, like red splotch on my face. And like, for me, the Greek goddess that I am, that is very unusual. And so, (laughs) and he was like, okay, so like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I have good skin. And so he was like, um, that is, for you unusual for your face and that came first and so he was like usually when you're going to have a nervous system overload which like starts as something in your face hands or stomach then it might extend to shut down one of your body parts and you think your hip is broken and eventually (laughs) it might become depression or something like that but the idea was that basically or it might become an injury uh, in your body and so he was basically like look I want you to pay closer attention to your face when I thought back to injuries I'd had 
And when I talked to teammates, like I talked to Abby D'Agostino and she was like, oh yeah, like she remembered getting like a cold sore or like an eye twitch or like, you know, and so Ooh, now- I eye twitch. I get that sometimes. The eye, my eye would start twitching. That's a day off, Colleen, okay? Oh so my gosh, now, no, wow. So now, and for me, this shit is, oh sorry, this is like so life-changing because- you can curse on our podcast. We have, we have <laughs> encouraged <laughs> it. <laughs> so now, like if I get like a big pimple, for me, that's unusual. Like for someone yeah. else. And so it's all personal to you. But I think right. paying attention to your face is really helpful because we want like a physical sign to help us. And mm-hmm. it's been so like when I have something on my wow. face, Jeremy and I are like, it's time to like oh adjust, you know? So That's, I'm literally writing this down. <laughs> it might save like the rest of like your life, you know, a breakout, well, is not just a breakout. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting to think about that. I think there's an indicator of that with mental health as well. Cause you know, you talked about the hip. I feel like I'm the person who, uh, you know, I have a tiny little, like not even soreness yet, but something feels off and you like ring the alarms. You're calling your PT. You've got like, rally the- uh, <laughs> And I'm always like, it doesn't hurt yet, but it will. Like, this is going to be a problem. (laughs) Um, And I remember when I started working with my sports psychologist and I had these blocks, it was like my first year pro. I went from training 15 to 18 hours a week to like over 20 every week. And when I had time off, like it was awful. Like I hated days off and it was just horrible and I'd feel so bad. And it was really emotionally challenging for me. And she explained it to me as like, you are depleting your body of its, like you're depleting your body. We all kind of understand that, but you're also depleting your brain of dopamine. Like you are depleted and you have to recover. And she helped me kind of understand that like, you almost are like expecting these times that you're going to feel bad and preparing to deal with them uh, and recognize Mm -hmm. them as a sign. You really need that rest and you really need to take it easy on yourself. Um, And I think if we you know, it's kind of like the pimple on your face, like when you're not sleeping well, when you're not, uh, when you're feeling emotional in workouts for me, like it's all indicators that something's not clicking or something needs rest and reparation, not only physically, but on the mental side as well. Yeah. Yeah. We, that's a, but, that's a big one for me too. Now you say that emotional in workouts, that's usually a sign that like, I'm just, yeah. I'm over the edge. Like, I, you know, like I shouldn't be feeling like I need to cry doing tempo. Like that's ridiculous. Or I'm about to be on my period. It could be either one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's so hard though too, because sometimes like you go to the well with workouts, but I feel like, you know, when those are like the well workouts and like, I had some like pretty emotional workouts that weren't like the bad kind. They were like the good kind, but maybe we just have to learn. Um, maybe what's the, Tell us more about the difference between a bad emotional workouts and good emotional workouts. I think the good kind are like, well, I can't think of a good emotional workout <laughs> that I've had since before Rio, to be honest. But it was like when Ian was my coach, this, this guy who was an Olympian himself, and he could do workouts with me. And maybe it was just like a so special... Nice. <laughs> it was so nice. But I, I think the good kind of emotional was when... I was in a lot of pain and it was like doing something I'd never done before, but I knew I could do it. So I might've been like crying at moments through the end of a rep, but it wasn't like an injury pain. It was simply that I'd never gone to that place before. So Mm. I think that's good pain, right? When it's not injury related, it's more like the outermost limits of your physical and maybe mental capacity but you can't do that all the time. Like this was like rare, right? Um, And I think that actually is really a reflection of coaching as well, I think, because in those moments you're pushing and you trust and do it. And I think there's probably a feeling of like being on track. I know for me, that's something like where I, when I feel like I'm about to do something amazing and I'm on track with my goals and my coach believes I can do it, that it may be emotional, but it's, it's the good kind. I think mm-hmm. when expecting something from yourself that you're not able to do, that can be the bad kind. For example, like mm-hmm. you were talking about tempo. Like if you go out and you're not 
at your limit. You're like supposed to do an easy day and it feels like the hardest thing in the world. Yeah. That's totally, I feel like that's a different kind of physical pain, but also like emotionally, the processing is different. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you're not even hitting your splits and it feels way harder than it should. And you're like, should be able to do this. And I'm, you know, I'm exhausted and that's, yeah. And then you get frustrated and then it's tight and then it gets worse. Like that's the bad, you know, that's definitely the bad kind. I was asking Alexi, cause I was like, usually if I'm having, like, I can't think of a time where I was like good emotions in a workout where I'm like emotional. Usually in my good workouts, I'm just calm and like, oh, that's it's cool. hard, but like, I'm in the flow state, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah. it almost feels easy because it's just all like clicking. And then I'm like, whoa, that's like, that's a good day when it, and, I, and I'm running faster than I expected to, or I'm like the splits that I'm, I'm running the splits I'm supposed to be running, but they feel easy. And it mm. feels like I could do this all day if I wanted to. Like, oh. that's my, that's my, I love those That's days. the best feeling <laughs> in the world. That is like, maybe that's like why we play our sports still. Cause you just like want that. Yeah. Feeling. You crave you just it. just want that feeling. Um, yeah. That's oh. the best feeling. Well, um, that kind of actually is a good transition. That's a, a good goal to have is to have those days. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about goal setting. Um, it's an interesting topic. It's something that um, I'm part of this uh, organization or community, I guess you would call it, called Voice in Sport. Um, Kate's been on their podcast too. I don't Have you been on the Voice in Sport podcast yet, Alexi? Yes. You have too. Okay. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. Just a great, great organization. Um, and they do some mentoring. And one of the things I talked to some of the, the girls on the platform, um, as a mentor is about, Oh, hi, Monty. (laughs) Hey, sorry for our, not at all. We love, we all three have dogs. (laughs) Pies in the other room sleeping. And Alexi has a little uh, Bernini in her house. I sent her to the dog park with <laughs> five <Yeah. for> Mimi. <laughs> well, Sorry. so anyway, no, anyway, so goal setting is really important with these young girls because, um, well, it's important for a few reasons. They usually have big goals. Um, a lot of them do already have big goals and it's more a matter of like figuring out how to break down their big goals into like media. We talk, I talk to them about like, you have this big goal that's at the top of your tree. And then you have like kind of medium size, you might have like three or four medium sized goals. And then off of each one of those medium sized goals, you might have two or three or four small goals. And instead of thinking every day when you wake up about your big goal, it's just, it's too much. It's not like manageable. So you really, what can you do today? Well, today you work on small goals until they create medium-sized goals, which eventually create your big goal. Um, But I was wondering from you about goal setting, I've heard you talk about how you don't make goals for yourself um, for more than a year in advance, which when I heard that, I was like, whoa, like, I don't know. I thought, I thought you would be thinking further in the future than that but I think it was really cool because you had said like I can't I almost like can't make goals like big enough for my future self that would be appropriate for my you know my future self two three four years down the line because I could set a goal and it just wouldn't be it wouldn't be big enough or maybe I've kind of changed courses a little bit and then you know it, it doesn't apply anymore so I love that you said that you would like make a goal that's maximum a year in advance but I just love to hear more about how you approach goal setting and maybe advice that you give others for how to set goals and how to kind of manage expectations around you know around big goals and maybe how how they can take those bite-sized steps to get to get to where they want to go yeah well um okay I think well I think the reason to what I chase beyond the one year goal is more like a feeling um, mm. rather than like a tangible. And it's, it's more, I don't know, it's more ephemeral. It's just, it's not like a concrete thing. And I think that's only because if I were to set concrete goals for more than a year in advance, I do think we can set, sell ourselves short or we can psych ourselves out. Like it can be, um, I think, we often outgrow ourselves within a year and we um, 
can surprise ourselves. So it just hasn't been very useful to me to think beyond a year um, for, for a number of reasons. Yeah. And then, so I love the idea of these like bite-sized tangible, like I can accomplish a task every day type goals that you talk about. Um, and I've really admired, you know, like your habit tracker that you, um, yeah, the with habits people. are the little goals. Yeah. There are things you can literally check the boxes off of. And like, we need those things because the mm-hmm. goal itself, we can't control whether we get or not. Like that's the truth, right? We cannot control whether we get the big goal, but we can control whether we set ourselves up to be able to check those boxes every day. And those need to be checkable boxes, right? Um, otherwise, what are we like literally doing with our time? Um, and I think what's, um, what's super important is like giving ourselves a period of time to be like in the incubator of any given North Star that we're chasing at that time. Because the, the, the most heartbreaking thing is when we see somebody who has a goal, like maybe it's a race coming up or something like that. And then they question the goal in like the middle of a, oh, the incubator, yeah. like in the middle of a workout that's going not so well. And you're like, well, that's not the time to question the goal itself. So <laughs> I think more than anything to give ourselves like intervals of time where we don't question the goal itself. We're just in the, whatever visualization, like I think about a ch- little chicken incubator or like a crock pot <laughs> or like a stew or like whatever it is. You have to be in there cooking some of the time. You can't just like be deciding what to cook all the time, Mm -hmm. right? So I think the most important thing is that we allow ourselves the grace to be in that bubbling stew, knowing that sometimes the stew looks like it's like cooking. Sometimes it looks a little static (laughs) like that. And that's the rule of thirds that I talk about, about like, we're not supposed to feel good every single day. Yeah. And that's normal. And, um, So I guess to answer your question, it's just like, I love your habit tracker because it gives you those tasks that you know you can do. Um, And I think, I don't know. I think something I admire about you is that you've given, you take your dreams seriously. And and that is awesome. Like, why not? Like take (laughs) your dreams seriously and you take mine seriously. And that's a good friendship too is like we're allowed to have dreams that feel a little bit big um, with each other. And I think for these girls, just finding people who it's safe for you to have a dream around because some people are just like crappy. Mm, And say it out loud. Well, this is is like are not helpful, right? Well, this is one thing we talked about. Like I, the, the way you talk about taking dreams seriously and for young girls to be able to do that, one, you're helping make that possible by walking the walk and and leading in that way but your story you weren't winning running races at age five saying I'm going to go to the Olympics it kind of unfolded naturally and at each point it seems like you just kept setting your sights higher and setting that goal and that benchmark higher for yourself Um, and Colleen and I talked about we both kind of had similar experiences I didn't start mountain biking till high school I was like a pretty bad athlete before that (laughs) hard worker, which kind of made it worse. And (laughs) that's not true. I didn't have that dream of going to the Olympics until I tried to make my first team. And then, you know, if you had told me at 17 that my goal would be to win the Olympics, like that would have been too much for me to handle at that time. So what advice do you give to young girls now that come to you and say, okay, I want to be you. I want to do what you're doing um, and allow them to take that goal seriously. But also to have this like appreciation for the process and be able to have some of the experiences we had where we didn't take it as seriously. And I went to college and I went to parties as a freshman and I didn't train 20 hours a week. And I, you know, was able to leave space almost for this unexpected goal to arise. Yeah. Well, probably that we have to like, we, I think our goal should always be like manifesting. This is going to sound so esoteric, but like (laughs) manifesting the like greatest version of ourselves in any given moment. And like, yes, like freshman year of college, I too went to parties and I didn't (laughs) know. Yeah. And and I met my husband, like I met my husband at a party. So it's like these things like are not for nothing. Right. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like it, and, and so I think like one manifesting the greatest version of yourself is something that you can only, you can answer to yourself about like what feels alluring to you at the moment. But if you have big dreams, that's wonderful. But in any given phase of your life, it should always be the goal. The goal should always be to try your best, not to be the best because you can't control that, but you can control your try and to just set your own personal improve as a person, meaning like PR is like a, a thing we use in running. And it's like, you want to just be better than you were last time, yesterday, last race, whatever. So that's, that's how like dreams come true is you just get, you get better incrementally on your own track and celebrate your wins. Like I remember when I was like the worst of my team, but then I beat someone, like I was like second to last <laughs> in a race. And I was like, well, I wasn't last this time. Nice. And like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we have to have a sense of humor about the process too, a little bit. Um, and the minute we think we know our future is like the minute we need to get help. Like that was <laughs> something that was very representative of my depression. I was like, I know the future is going to suck. And like, mm. no, I didn't like, no, I don't know the future. So maybe it's just like having the determination, but also the humility to know that like, we can't know, we can only just like keep trying our best and having an amusement about that try, not like a, you know, it's like, look at, look at that girl in her little snow globe trying her best. Like, I think it's very <laughs> adorable. Trying her best. <laughs> well, I I, the only <laughs> other thing I wanted to say about goals is um, I have this, so Kate and I got to hang out a little bit this fall in Bend, which was a such a surprise little get together. And it was amazing. She was training there and I was training there. And well, I remember being fire, but it ended up oh, yeah, yeah. fabulous, yeah. amazing training camp. And I got to see <laughs> Kyle, so uh, Sarah- we were just rolling with it. Um, and she was training because she started to compete that summer. But anyway, I remember Kate, when we were on this, the ski lift, we were like going to do a ropes course and we were on the ski lift and she was telling me about being a young athlete and I was, I just told all my friends the next day on the run about what you said. Cause I was like, I was still thinking about it. And I still think about it now. Like how, do you remember what we said? I don't remember at all. <laughs> this will be great. I'll remind you. So she was telling me about being a young, like a young athlete and, um, the way that she would approach racing. And I think it was just amazing for me because I have this, like, I have like the opposite way of approaching like racing. So I think maybe that's what it was. Did we just lose Alexi? Uh -oh. Well, hopefully she comes back. Um, but Kate, you said like you would go, are you there, Alexi? I'm here. Oh, you are. Okay. You I don't know why you okay I'm here. Up. You popped away from my screen for a second. Um, but anyway, so she, she was talking about, she would go into these races and she would just, for lack of a better term, she would go balls to the wall. Like she'd just be like all out, you know, I'm go going for it. Like not holding back. No such thing as like pacing yourself or like being, you know, conservative, like waiting for, no, no. Kate was just like, I'm going all in, like winner takes all. And then, you know, when you're younger, you, maybe you weren't really physically like prepared for that and so she she would go, she would go with this tactic but then she would get you know kind of demolished maybe or like not demolished but like you would like you know it's like you were gonna win and then it like turns out you didn't you know you didn't didn't win because you just went too hard in the beginning but she just kept doing it like people would tell her you know why why do you do it like like why don't you just hold back why don't you just pace yourself like instead of going to the front and then you end up finishing 10th, like if you just paced yourself, you could probably end up fourth or fifth. And I will never forget that she said her response was, well, I don't want to be fourth or fifth. So why would I do that? Like, that's stupid. <laughs> that's not the goal. <laughs> and I was just like, ah, oh my God, I was blown away by that because I don't know, I think as a, me as a little girl, I was just, I would have been way too afraid to go to the front and like pronounce that I belonged there. I would have just been like, I'm going to hang back here. Like maybe I'll move my way up as I gain confidence throughout the race. 
but like my but like tactics or like how I approached it is like so completely different. But I so much, I like almost, I like so much admire that, that I like wish that I was that confident. And I think that's something that I work with my mental coach um, about is building that confidence or just having that mentality of like, so what if I fail? So what if I, you know, go from the front and like act like I belong there and then I end up losing? Like, whatever and having more of a you know effort mentality of I'm just gonna try anyway even if it doesn't work out and I just love that with goals in general with like all your goals because Mm -hmm. I think I make my goals too small like I my boyfriend has actually been the biggest advocate of this of telling me that my goals are too small um because I want to set goals that like I think I can actually achieve rather than setting goals that like I'm like I might not be able to achieve that like I'd rather set the goal to be fourth because I know I can probably be fourth rather than set the goal of being first and then what happens if I'm seventh like oh no then it's so embarrassing or something well Mm -hmm. I think with with the with the story of going out too hot one thing I will say and Alexi I would love to hear you comment on this because I've actually heard you talk about this in podcasts about (laughs) coaches around you who allow you to push that boundary. Mm -hmm. Um, And as I transitioned to being a professional, I was in these races where I'd never finished in the top 10. I'd never placed at the front and I wanted to, I wanted to be able to win. And I had a coach in high school who would say, you went out too hard. You did this wrong. Like you need to pace yourself. You need to aim more realistically. Um, And when I changed coaches, his response was completely different. And he'd say, you need to go out with the front girls and figure out what it takes to be there. And then you're not going to be able to do it. And my job is to make you able to do it. And we're going to work together to make you able to do what it takes to stay there. So it was like partially, you know, having the guts to try. But I think for me, I, I have, you know, more been in the Colleen small goal boat of not thinking that's possible for me. And it took this coach to allow me to see that possibility and to feel like I wasn't alone in pushing my hardest and having someone that would help me get the most out of that experience. Yeah. Oh, I love this. I love all of this. Um, (laughs) Well, I'm also wondering, you know, Colleen, I think it's so exciting that you're shifting some of like your dynamics and your training and your coaching and all this stuff. And you don't, you've talked about it enough that you don't need to share about it, but I just, and you can, but I also just (laughs) think it's exciting to think about what that kind of like diversity in your training is going to bring you on start lines because you don't lose anything that you have learned or gained from where you were. You only gain, I think, from what you, where you're headed, you know? Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, and Alexi has been such a good role model for me, a role model and support system, you know, somebody who, what did you say the other day? You just, um, the word you use cold call, like she'll just cold call oh. me sometimes. <laughs> I love the cold call, <laughs> which is great, yeah. but just to check in because she knows that like, yeah, going through a change in sponsor and a change in coach and a change in team, like it's all kind of scary and new and different and, you know, kind of, I'm like in between two different worlds right now, um, or I'm, I'm less in between. I feel like I've kind of bridged the gap a bit, but it takes time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult, but I think I'm getting new, new tools, like different things that I think I used to kind of wish that I had or used to complain about. And now I have, and I have kind of adjusted I wouldn't say I like lost things but like there's always ups and upsides and downsides to any situation and so like one thing that I don't have anymore is that built-in um training system of training partners you know like 10 people who are just there every day for me to run with that I don't have to you know think about or ask them to be at the workout or like we're all doing the same thing and that's just like built into my old system and I don't have that anymore but I have like a totally different support system and like we're totally out of time but I wanted to talk to you about like support systems too and and how important that is because none of us are ever doing this alone even if we feel like we are sometimes it's not true there's so many people in our system in our solar system who 
you want to, you know, want to be there to help support you in so many different ways, whether that's like your physical coach, like your running cycling coach or your mental coach or your, you know, physiotherapist or your acupuncturist or your chiropractor or your massage therapist or, you know, like all those body, uh, body work people, but also like family and friends and people in, like I call both of you gals, sisters in sport. Um, you have sisters in sport and your sport and in different sports. Um, and I, ha- I feel like I have a lot of those people um, as well as people who are not in a sport or not in, you know, not in their athletes in the way that they use their bodies, but they're not like professional athletes um, yeah. who are also in my support system. And so, yeah, it's been a, like a really big transition, but I think um, all for the best and definitely feel you know, those relationships and that support system is going to be more important, you know, than ever. Um, as things are, whenever things get hard or challenging, that's when you lean on those people, you know, more yeah. than ever. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know what I'm, I, I just think that like our sports have to grow with us, you know, like we can't, we're just not Peter Pan's, you know, and we don't need to be, <laughs> or like, we don't need to be the same thing forever. And yeah, I think, you know, it can be terrifying to, yeah. to make this shift because you're like, we could try to stay in Neverland and there are benefits oh, yeah, to that. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, I'm not but there's also, <laughs> we're just not. And like, life does keep getting better if we embrace yeah. it that way, right? Um, yeah. And it is fun. I don't know. It is fun to think about uh, how we can grow and how our sport can grow with us. Um And with the, in terms of the like support networks, I think one of the coolest things that we realize is that it's like a two-way street where there are some, you know, like even the idea of mentorship, I think in, you know, that word seems to be a word that's passive where it's like you give mentorship and you receive it kind of passively. And I think you could think about support as that way too. But I think at its best, we actually could reach for mentorship or we can reach for support. Um, And that could be for your mental health. It could be for whatever training athletic goals you have, but just seeing it as something that we have agency in and like, we're allowed to ask. And the only, the worst thing that can happen is people say no. So like, whatever, like, it's like, yeah, they're lost. (laughs) Exactly. And I think what I admire so much, you know, about both of you, but what I know about both of you is that you have put yourself in situations where you feel safe enough to fail. And that is the only way you're going to succeed is if you're in an environment and that means like with your partner, like with your team, like with your coat, whatever, coach. whatever. Yeah. But where like, if you fail, like their ego is not at stake and it is not you know, you're safe. And that's really the only place that you could succeed. And um, I've been thinking about that a lot. Wow. lately. It's true. I mean, I, yeah. and I, I think I've told you this, Colleen, but I thought about this a lot lately, because some of the things I'm doing creatively are really new to me. And if I felt nervous, like I wasn't allowed to fail, then I, w- then I would just be so stunted, you know, yeah. like we have to feel safe enough to fail and that, and we will inevitably be able to succeed in that um that kind of soil I don't know I was like are we plants are we like do we start out as like a bunch of strawberries in a strawberry field and then you you, like move it to like the bigger um I don't know we have like a little seedling in one of those little like you have like one of these things and then it grows to a bigger plant and then you get a pot for it and then eventually the pot goes out into the garden and it can be strong enough to withstand you know, the nature basically. <laughs> and then you start a pesto business. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, it does, this is important to me. I think this conversation, because it goes beyond like the typical, like this is satellite teammate ship that everybody's witnessing yes. here. Like none of us yes. are teammates in the traditional sense. It's satellite teammate ship. And I think that's the most important kind because that's Mm -hmm. the kind that will keep you company when you are alone, like Mm -hmm. in your house, wondering, like you get to have it all the time because it's an energy and it's like a vibration that's supporting you. And, you know, I think that is so generous and it's something that I'm actively like asking to continue to be a part of with you both um, Mm -hmm. because I need it. 
you know? Yeah, same. Yeah, I love that you came up with that satellite teammates. And yeah, um, Kate is one of my satellite teammates too. Even we're not, you don't have to be in the same sport to be satellite teammates because we're we're all like we all embody that like more than an athlete, you know, mentality of like I'm doing more than just running. Like this is about more than running in circles and jumping over things and splashing in water. Like that's like the basics of what I do, but it's you know, it means so much more to me than that. And so that translates to other sports and other people and other walks of life and like other yeah women men like other people so easily um because it's yeah it's about more than just running yeah I feel that way about your book as well and I think I've had an interesting time thinking about this during COVID when racing has been postponed uh, or canceled completely and I think I realized that a lot of things in my life that have been celebrated have been things I've done. Like there's a, there's a period of time you like win a race and then you celebrate it and you know, it's over and it's, you enjoy it and you make the most of that experience and then you move on. And right now, Alexi, like, I think the moment you're having with this book with, you know, all the podcasts and all of these exciting, Mm -hmm. like it is a moment. It's like winning a race. You're winning a race right now. Yes. But I think something that makes it really special is that you're being celebrated for who you are. And that's what I think I feel when I connect with other female athletes is it's a celebration of who you are as a person in the context of what you do, but not necessarily anything that you do or have done or a box you've checked or a thing that Mm -hmm. is, has a timer on it for how long you're going to celebrate. Um, and so I think maybe, I don't know if we're, if you have any other questions calling, but one good maybe last question is yeah go for it oh Alexi like what is coming up next for you because I think we all see you having this moment and there's so many amazing things you're doing right now but a lot of your messaging is that like there's always an unexpected positive thing around the corner and that life is going to get better and be exciting and and there's going to be more opportunities in the future so what's up next (laughs) yeah okay this question is so like okay I'll tell you, but I also think because Top somebody secret. asked me recently, no, 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 it's not even that. It's that oh. somebody asked me recently, like what they can do to support like someone like after the Olympics so that they don't get post Olympic depression mm. or this and that. And I literally told them, just don't ask them what's next. Oh, because no. I think like, no, I'm going to answer this and it's not, I'm not, I'm good. Like, we're going to talk about it and all this stuff. But I was like, I think that like part of the problem is that we like are so accustomed to answering that question. The minute we've accomplished mm-hmm. something like the post-race interview is always like, what's next. And like, everything yeah. is always what's next. And I do think like, I'm not like upset. I'm just saying, I do think that like at some, yeah, like sometimes um, you know, it's a problematic question in some ways. However, I'll tell you what's next. Um, because I know, I know, and like whatever. But like, you know what I mean about that question? Where like we yeah. are asked that a lot. Um a lot. Yeah. I, for me though, I feel like there can be a nuance to it. And I'm sorry yeah. if I No, no, no. I'm I didn't bring that up to be like controversial. I just wanted to say it. <laughs> like the Olympics have been my greatest goal for the last four years and I mean, my goal is to win a medal at the Olympics. Like, it's a big thing. Like, I know if I'm on track, if I'm going to succeed or not, it's going to be over at a certain point. And when people ask what's next, I don't think of, like, a race I'm looking forward to. I think about planning my wedding. And it's Mm. going to be the next year. Like, there's going to be something great coming up. And so Mm. the thing for you right now could be that you get to take a break or that you get to – you have more time. And, I mean, I think you're more busy probably. But – like I <laughs> go on vacation. What's I'll next? take responsibility yeah. that yeah. No, it's my responsibility to not no. give you another Olympic type answer or whatever. Um <laughs> I get that. No, no, that's good because we're not gonna stop getting asked the question. So maybe what you're saying is like that question's probably not going away. It's just how we answer it needs to come from a a place that feels, you know, whatever more holistic. Good, a more holistic. A holistic yeah. response, not right. just, okay. like just athletic. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my answer is, well, we are shooting a movie soon. 
and I'm really excited about it. It's like a small but exciting movie with a bunch of comedy types from some shows you've all seen. Um, I am, I'm, we moved, we bought a house. And so I'm kind of just like trying to enjoy that new environment and really move in. Um, it's funny because now I'm like, give the answers that are not the accomplishments. Um, I'm, (laughs) I'm training, I'm training, but I like, I didn't race at all in December, January. I mean, Kate is in your head now, Alexi. She's in there. Well, (laughs) because she's right that like, it's not like my, it's not anyone else's problem to like, not ask that question. It's my problem to like, make sure it doesn't get to me in that way. So she's right. Okay. Um, I'm going to race eventually, but I'm not sure when I'm hoping the spring. So like the Olympics is still on my mind. I just have to figure out what races are possible and what's happening. So I'm still like trying to navigate that as I think we all are, but that's Mm -hmm. still happening. Um, and yeah, there's some fun, like creative stuff. It's basically just trying to like keep growing and uh, some television stuff, which is like different than movies. So it's like trying a new event. I'm trying a new <laughs> event creatively and I'm trying to master one event athletically, which I still am not best friends with the marathon, but we'll get there. <laughs> Does anyone ever best friends with the marathon? I feel like it's such a love hate relationship for everyone who's ever done it. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I've some never done one, really so I have it. no idea. <laughs> some people love it. I mean, I, you know. I loved the 10 K. So like, I know you can love events. Do you still yeah. love the steeple? You love it. I still love the steeple. Sometimes the steeple is like that friend who like you hang out with a ton, but then sometimes when you haven't seen her for a while, like you hang out with her again and like, she like slaps you in the face. Hmm. That yeah. sounds like She's a like sister to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a sister. <laughs> have a sister. She can kind um, of be a sometimes, yeah. but she's she loves you, and you have to just know that, and you know, take it what she does to you with the with knowing that you know she does love. She loves me. She loves me. She loves me. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my gosh! Well, I can't wait to meet you, Kate. I will meet you in person. And I'm yes, so excited. We have to have a, a post COVID like hangout. Yeah. I want to go on like a, this sounds so stupid. I want to go on like a vacation that has like the ability to run and train, but also like it's vacation. D- does that, that make me officially 30 years not, old? That is not <laughs> stupid at all. That sounds great. Like one of those uh, vacations you can get up and do like an amazing like run and then yeah. you have like this beautiful breakfast spread waiting for you when you get back and then you spend the rest of the day on the beach yeah like one that's not (laughs) training camp because those camps can feel like that but one that's like a little bit more vacation oriented yeah yeah great we'll do it well i'll start scouting spots i'll let you know what's up next vacation (laughs) (laughs) that's my jam well thank you so much for being our first guest for our book club podcast webinar series um like <laughs> that was a wonderful thing we can move need to like figure out a name for it and stuff so we're working on it but your book was I've said it a million times but I'm gonna say it again it was beautiful and it's so well done and just you're an amazing person and we really appreciate you thank you I'm so grateful you know I am I love you both and we're all teammates now that is like yeah. teammates forever yeah <laughs> Thank you everyone who joined and I'm going to, it's recording. So I'm going to, after this is over, I'm going to figure out how to, where it goes. It goes to the cloud somewhere. So I'm going to find it from the cloud and then I'm going to get it. And then I'm going to put it on Instagram or YouTube or something. So look out for that. It's first time we're over here. I'm figuring out the zoom webinar thing, but um, we're, yeah, we're going to post it. So everyone who missed it, you can share it with your friends and um, watch it whenever you'd like. But thank you, Alexi. Thank, thank you. you. Kiss have those wa- Oregon clouds for me. I miss them. I will. <laughs> have a great night, everybody. All right. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.